Here's your solution to healthy, happy soil. Add lots of organic material. Add wood chips, add compost, and that is the solution for most everything. I have a huge lot that I want to put uh, fruit trees on instead of just putting any tree. I figured I would get some food out of them. So today I ordered some figs, some apricots, some peaches, some mulberry. Um, what else did we get? Hey, what do you think about that? Do you like fruits? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I came for the tour, his first tour of the season, um, two or three weeks ago. And that's when I started um, getting interested in uh, fruits and vegetables also. So I'm starting a garden, a vegetable garden as well. So, Wait till we talk about it. so I wanted to drop it down so we get blood water again. I went out there digging, I had 16 inches of topsoil. And that was just from adding organic material to the top and letting nature take its, and do its work. Jack and I dropped into Greg's fruit tree workshop on Saturday morning and returned the following day for a sit-down interview. Today I am in Phoenix, Arizona with the legendary, really, Greg Peterson at the Urban Farm. Now when I first came to Phoenix in June, everyone said, well have you met Greg? And uh, I said no, and so well you have to meet Greg. And so now on the second trip we're finally getting to meet Greg. Now Greg, you have an urban farm, you do workshops, you have tours, you have a podcast. I mean what, what aren't you doing in terms of urban farming? Well I hope I'm doing it all. You're doing it all, of course you are. Yeah. <laughs> You know, really, I, I believe that the whole notion of growing food in the city or urban agriculture, urban farming, is one of the large solutions to our food conundrum that we're in right now. Right. Well, they say that in the future, 70% of the population is going to be in cities. Right. And so the more that we can do outreach to get people interested in urban gardening or mm -hmm. urban farming, farming. Yep. tell us about that. He has a thing about urban gardening versus urban farming. And I heard that on your podcast. Yeah. Tell my audience about yeah, that. Yeah, so urban gardening is, it's a hobby. Right. Okay, and I love it. Completely yes. works. Okay. Urban farming, I, I feel like it's a little bit more official. Uh -huh. You know, people take farming a little bit more seriously. Okay. So, and, and it's really just a subtle shift in how we think. Mm -hmm. And here's the quiz that I give people. Mm -hmm. How many people grow food out there? So raise your hand if you're growing food. And how many people share food with somebody that they know, right? Pineapple guavas. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're growing food, you're gonna be sharing it with somebody. Mm -hmm. So you're an urban farmer. Okay, okay, okay so well. It's, it's that subtle of a shift. I have such a small space mm -hmm. that I, okay. I never think of myself as, I call it a micro farm. Perfect. <laughs> Fantastic. You can raise a lot of food in a 10 by 10 space. Yeah, you, you kind of have to go up. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the vertical part and, you mm -hmm. know, you can grow cucumbers and squash and they'll vine up and beans will vine up. and. So you've done all this. Now, where do you go from here? I mean, is it just more outreach, convincing more people, getting more people excited? Or what are your goals from here? So this is my 41st year of growing food in Phoenix. Wow. I've been seriously doing it for about 25, uh -huh. 26 years. And what I've noticed just over the past 18 months to two years is this tremendous interest in people wanting to know how to grow food. So like, you know, we'll have 120 people show up at one of our tours. Well, what's going on in Phoenix? I mean, I don't sense this, maybe it's happening in Los Angeles mm -hmm. where I am because we're so spread out. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's spread out here too. It's spread out here too. But the, I don't know if you know this, but everybody refers to this whole area of Mesa, Tempe, Phoenix, Gilbert, Scottsdale as the valley. Yeah. Everybody says they live in the valley. valley. I'm going, what's the valley? Yeah. It's just one big desert to me. But, yep. but uh, 500 square miles, 4.4 million people. So you ask me what's next for me. It's really what's ultimately for me. And uh, in 1991, I did a class mm -hmm. uh, where I had to define for myself who I was in the world. Wow. And okay. I, I created myself to be back then the person on the planet responsible for transforming our global food system. 
Okay. So I don't I see mean, nothing the word... like setting big goals. Why not? <laughs> right. Why not? I'm a believer. Right. Let's see, I think it was Wes Jackson with the Land Institute that said if you're if you're not thinking out a hundred years and the difference that the work you're doing right now is gonna affect a hundred years down the road, you're not thinking big enough. Okay. I'm not thinking big enough. <laughs> so here's what I tell people. There's three things in our culture that cause one hundred percent of the disease. And I've actually talked to food. To, I've talked to medical doctors, nutritionists about this lack of nutrition in our food right environmental toxins right and stress yes right absolutely go garden i know it's I know. it reduces your if stress you're depressed, right go garden. yeah well, if you're and, stressed and, go garden exactly <laughs> and they found that the the microbes in the soil have anti antidepressant qualities to them what? yeah get out yeah isn't that's it cool? awesome isn't that cool now are you doing wood chip Mulching? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Everybody should be using thick, thick, thick layers of wood chips. Well, where are you using it? Because I see grass, uh -huh. actual grass yeah. out here. So. so this is a flood irrigated yard. So I have um, a water right that comes with this land that I live on because it used to be an old citrus orchard. So 22 oh, I times a year. That came from yeah, 22 that. times a year I get six inches of water in my yard. And so that's how I water my 80 or so fruit trees here on the property. Okay. What I've done is I've gotten specific places around the yard that the water can get into, but it doesn't wash the wood chips away. Do a dome on your tree? You mean put it on a mound in the... Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Especially you want to plant your tree on a mound in the middle, especially when you're putting wood chips around it. So basically you're isolating your wood chips and building them up around the trees. Exactly. So that the flood doesn't wash it away. Exactly. But the flood is close enough to the trees mm -hmm. it can to still, still percolate feed, in. It That's still right. feeds the roots. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. And where do you get your wood chips or do you create your own? Um, a, a little bit I create my own. Uh, but I listen. Okay. So the last batch of wood oh, chips. Oh, that's that what I, got I did. Here, you listen for the wood chipper in the neighborhood. That's right. Somebody was somebody <laughs> right. was chipping in the neighborhood. That's what Maybe I did. Six, yeah, of course. Yeah. One, you know, listen is one way. Yeah. Always Craigslist. Oh. You know, people. Chips. Yeah, people will. So check Craigslist if you're yeah. looking for your wood chips. Yeah, local utilities. The problem with getting them from local utilities and tree services, you get a lot. You get a lot and you don't know what it is, right? I mean, it's all mixed well, together? See, I don't, that doesn't bother me. Okay. Oh, as far as I'm concerned, a wood chip is a wood chip is a wood chip. Okay. It all eventually breaks down to organic matter. All right. That's good to know. So, I, it doesn't matter to me. I'll take whatever you got. I do a lot of experimenting here. Mm -hmm. So, I run a, an annual fruit tree program where I teach people how to grow fruit trees. Right. And then they can get fruit trees from me. Yeah. And I do that here in the valley. This is my oh, 17th exactly. year doing it. And so what I'm constantly doing is planting experimental trees in so that I can experiment, see how they're going to do here, and let my listening audience know, hey, you know what? This tree, <laughs> an Anna apple, oh my gosh, plant one of these. Right. This right. tree over here, a mini royal cherry, forget about it. Okay. Not going to work. Not going to do well. Yeah. When you started doing your, mm -hmm. your fruit tree tours or mm -hmm. workshops, mm -hmm. were there just like a handful of people? Oh, and now yeah. you've got a hundred and something. So how much time yeah. did it take for the word to get around? I do bottom up work. So I'm always looking to see how I can integrate this kind of stuff more into neighborhoods and make people happy with it. And I started doing classes in my living room for fruit trees and different things in you can do this 2000. Too. <laughs> and so, you know, my living room, we can seat six people. Mm -hmm. So I'd get six people sitting in a circle and I'd be talking about fruit trees. And so it just grew from there. And it just grew from there. And, and what is the, you know, for somebody coming in, who's never done it, they just have a normal mm -hmm. Phoenix yard. Mm -hmm. I, or I, what is the interest? urban yard. Urban yard. What is the what is the interest for them? Are, are they going, well, I just heard about it. I want to try it. I'd say most people, are interested in where their food's coming from okay. and securing a a healthy and consistent supply of food for themselves. I'm just planting seeds, unintended. I'm just planting seeds for people to go out and do this themselves. If all of a sudden there were 10,000 urban farms in Phoenix, which is one of my goals, you asked me 10, earlier. All you right, asked me you earlier. heard it here. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> 10,000 urban farms in Phoenix. That's a movement. That is a movement. That's a movement. On my YouTube channel, I once got this comment mm -hmm. from somebody. You know, I said I have a small garden. 
and that somebody wrote and said, you call that a garden? That's a driveway with pots. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I am trying to inspire people, even if they right. have this much space on a balcony mm -hmm. to take charge. That's right. And That's I, right. I think the whole idea is not how much space you have, how many plants you have, how many trees you have. It's are you connecting with soil and the growing of a plant? Yep, and the neighborhood. And you put it I, out front. You know Ron Finley. Of course I know Ron. That's how he started. No, I know. He took the strip out in front of his house. I know. And he converted it from grass into <laughs> a garden. And then the city of Los Angeles came down on him. Well, I know how I know the story. Good. And, so uh, you know. Yeah. So uh, that's gardening. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely. In fact, I he, consider. He's, he's a gangster gardener. That's great. what he calls himself. Great. I awesome. consider you an urban farmer, even Thank with you. your few. <laughs> Dang straight. Thank you. Yeah. Thank if you're growing food, if you're growing anything, claim your urban farmership. Okay. Just claim it because there's something magical that happens when you say, you know what, I'm an urban farmer and I'm going to start growing food. Mm -hmm. It shifts how you think about where your food comes from and how to grow food. And then there's a third step. So we talked about growing food, sharing it. There's a third step. You always need to name your farm. Well, I call my garden, and yeah, I call it fine. a late bloomer garden. I'm Great. always referring to it as Perfect. a late bloomer garden, but um, I'm going to start referring to it as the late bloomer garden being a micro farm. Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. Because here's what happened. You know, yeah. I've been calling this place the urban farm since 2001. Right. And it's internationally known. That's awesome. You know, it's known around the country. It's mm -hmm. definitely known around the state. Mm -hmm. It's become something. And it hasn't become something because I called it Greg Peterson's Garden, although you can definitely call, name your farm that. It's become something because I put this notion of urban farming out there, called it the urban farm, and the name stuck. Well, it's interesting because we were at Greg's tour yesterday doing some uh, filming, mm -hmm. and I met a couple of ladies, one of which, Ordered Trees, is getting just getting right. started, uh, Corinne. Uh -huh. And... Um, and then uh, Corinne was with Darlene, and I started talking to Darlene, and she's got 80 trees, and, wow. and, and she's got a vegetable garden, mm -hmm. and we decided to go and film her garden last night. So nice. just the community of meeting Greg, go. coming here, and then we met Darlene and her husband and her beautiful children, mm -hmm. and how they're doing a whole experiment in, in their yard, and yeah. it's just a yard. But they've turned. They've right. got compost, chickens, yep. vegetable garden, fruit trees, the whole nine yards. It's really exciting stuff. Plus, plus, plus. Plus. That person that called yourself your thing just pots. Yeah. Poop on them. <laughs> and poop's a good thing in gardening. Yeah, because, we love poop. Because you know what? Here's what I do in the world. I hold up gardening and urban farming and growing your own food like this. Oh my gosh! Look at this, and you can do it too. That's right. And even, right. even if you're growing a pot of basil in a Sunday sunny windowsill. That's what I always say. That's yeah. right. Yeah, you're That's doing right. it. That's right. You're doing it. That's right. And it's positive. It's happy. It's fun. Yeah. You know, you're getting pesto out of your basil on your windowsill. I know. So a number of people will say to me, oh, I have a black thumb. I can't. They just dismiss it. Oh, I don't have any space. I live in an apartment. They just dismiss it. And I go, there's so many things you can still do. And then, and then someone said to me, Oh, I had a, I had a cactus and I killed it, you know, or, or, or I had, a, I had a plant on my desk and I killed it. I said, Well, what did you feed it? And they looked at me like, What? I said, Well, you, people can't live without food. Neither can plants. You've got right. to feed them eventually. Well, water them. <laughs> Quite often, it's a watering issue. Yeah, too much water. Too much water or not enough water. Right. So here's what I tell people about black thumbs or brown thumbs. Yeah. The only place that concept lives... In your head. In, in your, your head. head. <laughs> That's right, in your head. Because I guarantee you, if you pay attention to a plant, it's going to grow and thrive. When you start this notion of rainwater or gray water harvesting, where we're actually going and getting that water, mm -hmm. So getting rainwater or harvesting gray water out of your house, uh, a lot of people want to put it in tanks yes. and store it for later. It's really expensive to do it that way. I know. So what, <laughs> so what I encourage people to do is direct the water, either your gray water or your rainwater, direct it into a part of your landscape where then when it rains, 
the water goes there, and then you landscape around that space. Okay. So that when the water does come, what you get is a nice bunch of water for your fruit trees. Okay. So that, that's I got really some work to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big believer that if you have a yard, you should have three or four or five hens, no roosters, hens, because they're great workers for the yard. My chickens, my hens, mow the backyard for me. They eat bugs, they eat weeds, They'll, they're great tillers, so they're, you know, they're tilling some of the space for me. So they're doing a lot of the work for me in my gardens. But and can they fly over the fence or? The, so the cool thing about chickens is, is they pretty much know where their home is at. They don't go very far. And if you're really, you know, if you're really concerned about that, you can flip their wings, which is just like, you know, cutting our nails. So this is a four week old hen. Um, and, you know, we raised them from chicks. Mm -hmm. She's gonna go for my shoulder here, you watch it. <laughs> That's what they do. Do you have anything ripe, any fruit ripe that I could try before I go? Yes. What? Pomegranate. Oh! Oh, pomegranate. That's kind of messy. Not kinda. <laughs> it's very messy. Alright, let's see it. Yeah. Crack that baby open. Oh. Wow. Oh my gosh. So, do I just grab some seeds? Yeah, just grab some seeds. Right okay. There. So here's this gorgeous thing, and well, Let's see how it tastes. That, that one's that, nice. That is nice. That one's nice. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> I want. Are pomegranate trees hard to grow? I want one. Oh, they're easy. They are. Oh yeah. You think super super easy? Grow well in California? Yep. Absolutely will grow well in California. All right, maybe I'll have one in the late bloomer garden micro farm. There you go. <laughs> there you go.